by Albert Spence. Thank you guys for taking the time to hear us. Uh, my name is Albert Spence. I've been a uh, nurse for 31 years uh, until approximately April 1st uh, after cardiac surgery, I'm done. Um, after what I experienced as a traveling COVID nurse, bedside nurse between January 20th and approximately April 1st, I had told my wife, I'm not going back if they paid me a lot more than the $120 an hour I was making. I've turned down $156 an hour. I ain't going back. Not after what happened to me on January the 20th of this year. In my 18 years as a bedside pulmonary nurse in Anderson, South Carolina, and it was pulmonary telemetry, but a heavy lean on the pulmonary. If it was anything respiratory in our community, we got it on our floor because we were like the only floor in a hospital that had negative pressure rooms. We got the TB patients, TB rule out usually, but we got everything, whether it was flu A, RSV, uh, HCAP, uh, community acquired pneumonia, uh, COPD exacerbation that turns into pneumonia. All of this and all the physicians that I worked with it put me to work and I just did what they told me to. I'm not a doctor, I'm not an expert, but I have watched what they did over 18 years and it always revolved around get your patient up in the chair, Albert. They gave antibiotics, breathing treatments and steroids for 18 years for bacterial pneumonia. No matter what brought them in, inflammation was the enemy, they explained to me. Inflammation is the enemy. Antibiotics and steroids and breathing treatments, which was uh, steroidal breathing treatments. And they said, you've got to mobilize these patients. If they don't get up in the chair and you don't get them up on the bedside commode chair and you don't start walking them to the bathroom, if you just let them lay in the bed, the horse that lays down stays down. You've got to get your patient moving. So nursing, PTOT, we got them patients up. Our nursing assistants, we got them patients up. We got them moving, which they could much more readily clear their secretions. They ate better. They felt better. They did better. They used their eyes and flutter, and we would get them out of there seven to ten days, no matter what brought them in, bacterial or viral. We got our patients out. Patients would say, am I going to be all right? I'm sticking them with IVs and loading them up and asking them questions to get them in there. I'd say, you're going to be all right. We get our patients out of here. 99% of the time, we got them out. I mean, home back to the nursing home, to rehab, or home. We were successful. And so when all this COVID stuff started, I was the biggest COVID believer there ever was, how bad it was, how virulent it was. This is serious stuff. I had an elderly mother at the time who was in stage lung and kidney, and she didn't need this stuff. And I didn't want to bring it home to myself or my wife. I had a COVID unit set up in my garage so I could isolate myself when I caught COVID from my family. I took this very seriously. I believed in all the scientists, and I believed in what we did was, what we were doing was helping. And the few days that we had COVID on our unit, when half of it was designated COVID, I worked with a few COVID patients. When I got floated to other units, I worked on COVID patients there and saw what they did. And I was asking all the nurses, have you all caught it? How bad is it? What's the symptoms? I wanted to know for me and my family too. And are you going to take the vaccine? We talked about nothing but COVID all day, every day, forever. COVID, 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 because I wanted to know. I believe in self-preservation, too. And I also love my patients and loved all of them. We want them to get out of there, and we did. So I'm on a COVID unit in Anderson. I gave him disappear to this guy, and he was Hispanic. They don't complain. They're very stoic. So this guy, within an hour, he starts crackling I could hear him from the doorway and I knew that was flash pulmonary edema I can't say that I'm a nurse but I can go to the nurse practitioner in this case and say you might want to look at him he's looking bad and she got to the doorway and could hear it and she come out and she said 40 Elasix stat and push him to the ICU I didn't know why I just given him remdesivir it's an antiviral it's supposed to make him better I just thought well he just he's just turning bad I didn't understand what remdesivir could do as far as flash pulmonary edema, increasing your inflammation and your response to inflammation. I didn't connect the dots. I'm still new at this. But I can tell you whether it's lawnmower dust, whether it's anything you inhaled that would irritate your lungs, they're going to swell up. Any reaction that your lungs are feeling, whether it's viral, bacterial, or environmental, 
it's going to be an injury to your lungs. Your body's natural response is to swell up. That's all the fluid, and it's the perfect breeding ground for bacteria. Antibiotics, breathing into treatments and steroids. Here we go. But everybody was treated the same because it all goes to bacterial pneumonia. That's why when you go in the hospital today and see what the COVID patients are getting, it is not antivirals, but for the first five days. After that, it's all antibiotics. We give them steroids. Yes, we give zinc and vitamin D, or did. And early on, we gave convalescent plasma. And that's the blood transfusion of people that had COVID and got over it. And I was really hopeful that was going to make a big deal. But before I left Anderson Hospital on December 26, I asked a full-time COVID nurse, I said, so this plasma you're giving, that's really helping. She said, uh, she didn't tell me why. She said, give it slow. No more than 100 cc's an hour. Typically, we give plasma, it's 200 to 250. We slam it in there. No big deal, normally, for different reasons. But she said, for COVID patients, you better not go over 100. I said, noted. So I took three weeks off, did all my paperwork, went travel nursing, COVID nursing, full-time COVID nursing, Lexington Hospital. When I got there, I said, and we're going to do the convalescent plasma. And she said, manager, she said, no, they've quit doing that. I said, why? She said, this dead in two days, average. I was like, wow, well, I'm glad y'all are seeing the light, recognizing what's not working, and making the difference for our patients. Thank goodness y'all saw the light and, and quit doing that. You, you've tried it. It don't work. I get it. Now what do we do? And they said, get to it. So my first week there, I had some really, really bad COVID patients on high flow oxygen. They'd said they had been there three to four weeks. I said, can you get up? Can you sit up? My reflexes get you up. They said, I can't even take the mask off long enough to put a spoon up to my face for a second. And my sats go down to 70. These people are in stage. Yes, they're not on the ventilator, but I'm telling you, their, their white counts were good. Their bacteria was over, but their lungs are shot from three, four weeks of bacterial pneumonia that just eats their lungs up. There's no available lung service left for oxygen exchange. No CO2 oxygen can go on through scar tissue. That's why they can't get off the high flow. That's why they go to the ventilator and can't get off because their diaphragms are weak. They're laying there, they're sedated. You got a tube in everywhere and they make a couple of extra. The ventilator is a death spiral down. So once you get on the ventilator, you're that bad, you're bad, you're probably not gonna come off the ventilator. But the high flow people couldn't come off either. Even though they were stabilized on high flow, they couldn't come off all that stuff. And if you move them when they've been there three weeks laying in the bed. And I asked them, I said, have you been getting up? They said, you're the first person that's tried to get me up. You're the first person that's tried to get me up. Yes, PT and OT was ordered, but they'd go in there and the patients would whine and say, I feel bad, I feel bad. Okay, mark you down for refused. We'll do some bed mobility, but we're not gonna mobilize you because you feel bad. So it's partly the patient's fault. They wanna roll in there, lay in the bed and get better. You can't do that. And as a pulmonary nurse, I would really, we would all really push these patients up and get them going. But for our COVID patients, we were encouraged to limit our exposure. We were encouraged to group our care. I talked to one COVID nurse, not at this last hospital, but other COVID nurses. They said, yes, the pharmacist will work with you and they'll schedule all the meds around breakfast, lunch, and dinner to limit the times you have to go in there. Oh, that's a great idea. I won't catch it. I thought, that's great. And so my first week in Columbia, I was, had my head down doing my thing, IVs, pills, in and out of the room, putting all this stuff on, PAPAR, et cetera, following the protocol. I didn't want to catch it. When I got off from work, I stripped down to my underwear and Crocs and went home. Okay, second week there. Well, instead of 38 patients, we have 30. Hmm, next week, 24, 25. Next week, 15, 16. I said, wow, where's COVID going? They said, oh, well, it's just, so we're going to stay empty, 15 beds out of 38? And this is a COVID unit, been COVID unit. All rooms were negative pressures. The hallways were built negative pressure. They didn't convert it. It was built that way. So if COVIDs are going to come into this hospital, this is probably the best place to put them. I said, but what are y'all going to do with all these 15 empty rooms? Well, we're going to take all the COVIDs and put them on one end, and this whole other end of the hall, we're going to designate that regular patients. I said, all regular, regular patients, not COVID. They said, we're going to hold seven just in case COVID comes back. I said, cool. I got an easier job day. I only got three COVIDs today. So the next week, we dropped to like seven or eight COVIDs. I said, wow, out of 38, we're down to seven. 
I said, where did COVID go? This is great. And uh, they said, yeah, you're going to have more regular patients, cardiac, GI bleeders, stuff like that. I said, great. So next week, we dropped down to two or three. And I said, you got to be kidding me. Something's going on. And that's when I found out that on January the 20th, roughly, the CDC guidelines recommended that we roll the PCR cycling from the high 30s to 28, like it was originally designed to do. And then it hit me. And I lost sleep over it. I was having chest pain over it. And I, it woke me up in the middle of the night, like hit me hard. I could not sleep. I tossed and current because my first week or two there, I didn't do it. I didn't lead them to the gate, but I'm the guy that euthanized people. They call it comfort care. But when you get to the point you can't take high flow off, you get so upset, you ain't seen your family except maybe an iPad in weeks, and you're never going to come off the high flow. And the doctor says, you've done your best. You've done your best. But this is going to be it for you. And so the patients get all teary-eyed and upset, and they call in the palliative team, and they all hold their hand and cry, and they said, but we can keep you comfortable. Here comes Albert. He's got the morphine and Ativan, and I load them up and take off the high flow, and they gasp themselves to death. And I'm the guy that's pushing the button, like in the gas chambers at Auschwitz. No, I didn't lead them there. And honestly, I didn't know what I was doing. I just do what I'm told. It's not my fault. But after January the 20th, and then on into February 1st or so, I saw what change in the PCR did on my floor. And then I saw what I had not done for my COVID patients. And then I was also greatly encouraged, don't move them unless their SATs are above 90. Don't move them. I was like, but, but I've always been told, get them up and get them going. No, wait till their SATs are high 90s to move them. And I'm like, no, they can tolerate a minute or two down in the low 80s. Get them up, make them move, make them set up, and then they will learn to breathe deeper, and we can wean them off the oxygen. No, their focus was put them on more oxygen. Let them lay in a bed. I said, okay. Then I realized where our mistake is. Yes, early treatments, the HCQ, the ivermectin, real smart. Man, give them at least Tamiflu. But when the PCR cycling changed, I'm telling you, it was a big change on my floor. According to the CDC, according to DHEC, on their webpage, it says by January 20th, 1.6% of South Carolinians have been vaccinated. 1.6. Go forward a month, February 20th. According to the CDC, they said 7 to 9%. According to DHEC, they got the number exactly. It's 8% of South Carolinians have been vaccinated. But we on our floor saw a 67% in South Carolina. We saw a 67% decrease in COVID cases from January 15th to February 15th. Actually, it said February 3rd was vaccinated. But you're not fully considered vaccinated until that vaccine has been in your body two weeks. So that's January 15th to February 15th. 8%, and we had a 67% drop in COVID cases. Yes, COVID's real, but so is flu A. And how many of these COVID cases were really flu with this fake, false, faulty PCR cycling cranked up to I don't know what. Fauci even said back in July of 2020 in this Virology Weekly podcast live, he said a PCR over 35 is absolute false. You're not going to get correct data. You're not going to get, you're going to be giving out misinformation. He said that back in July of 2020. The CDC said crank that PCR up to 40. That's what they did all 2020 to generate all this giant pandemic and fear that kept me afraid of going in my rooms and doing anything but grouping my care. That's what brought us all this fear this pandemic is the PCR cycling. I'm telling you, it's the PCR is the elephant in the room. Yes, COVID's real, but we got to jump on this like we've always jumped on upper respiratory infections. And yes, there are early treatments with ivermectin and HCQ. Let me just tell you guys, if I get sick, I am not going to the hospital. Yes, I trust science. I just had open heart surgery, triple bypass, April 5th. But I thought, I'm home, I'm sitting in a recliner, I'm thinking, it's over, it's done, no big deal. Few people die because of their dumbness. 
and determination to make us go down this path to get a shot. I'm out of it, though. It's over. It don't matter anymore. And then here comes Delta. The same PCR that was giving us a pandemic in 2020 falsely is the same PCR that took it away when they cut the cycling down to 28 on the 20th, per the CDC guidelines. Now the same PCR that's going to be changed out for a multi, multiplex whatever at the end of this year, the same PCR is now giving us Delta, Zeta, Lambda, whatever. I don't think so. I don't trust them because I know they can't let it go away because Pfizer's got a million doses they want to stick to us. A billion doses they want to stick to us. For what reason? What's their motive? And what's there any connection between the CDC, CEOs, and Pfizer's? They're switching CEOs back and forth like uh, it's commonplace. And there's no conflict of interest there between the CDC and the FDA and Pfizer or any other big drug companies. And also no firsthand secondhand, I'm sorry, information that why did Pfizer get FDA approved? Not JJ, not Moderna. Come to find out, I know somebody on the inside indirectly. They said Pfizer gave the most money to the lobbyist. And what do the lobbyists do with that money? They gave the money to the lobbyists and the lobbyists lobbied their case to the FDA. And what they're doing with the money, I have no idea, but it's awful suspicious to me that Pfizer gave the most money and the lobbyists make it happen. And these COVID death shots, I know of at least a couple of people's paralyzed waist down. Hope they're getting better. And paresthesia. Look at Senator Ron Johnson's video where he interviews people that have been hurt by the shot. It's happening. People are dying from the shot. I got COVID nurse friends that say, yep, they said they took the shot two days ago and they've had a heart attack, they've had a stroke, they have thrombocytopenia, and they get all kind of nerve weird stuff going on, and they die. And a lot just, you know, it's reported to bears. I get it. But a lot of people don't report to bears. It's not right politics. And I'll tell you something else that was big going on between the COVID I took care of versus my 18 years. Our patients, if they weren't getting better, meaning their oxygen demand wasn't going down, we weren't weaning that oxygen down because they were resistant to what we was doing. It, or if we started going up on their oxygen, something's not going the right way. We consulted pulmonology. Pulmonology would go in there and order a slew more tests, usually repeat blood glasses, chest x-ray, CTs, and they do a bronchoscopy. I was told back in 2020, when I was at my old hospital, we don't do bronchs on COVID patients. I said, why? We do so many bronchs here, they try to do a bronch on me. Everybody gets a bronch. Just hold your hand up, they'll do a bronch. No bronchs for COVID, why? Oh, it'll aerosolize it in the bronch lab. I said, okay. Well, I got to Columbia. Yeah, sure enough, I've never heard of anybody getting a bronch. Never. What does a bronch do? It sucks out some junk. They get a culture to make sure they're on the right antibiotic, which sometimes resulted in the doctors going, yeah, it's not staph. It's not strep. It's, in this case, fungal. Switch their antibiotics altogether. But at least cleaning them out, give the antibiotic a foothold chance to get them going. And then, what do you know? We're weaning their oxygen down. It always helped them, these bronchs. We can't do bedside bronchs anymore. We can't do bronchs in the bedside with negative pressure even, with disposable bronch tubes. Nope, no one gets a bronch when you have COVID. That to me is the way we used to treat respiratory patients to the way we're treating now, that is murder. Withholding care is murder when you know better. I didn't know better, I just ate it and abetted. But I ain't going back. Mr. Spence, can I ask you a question, please, and help me? I'm going to ask you two questions. Yes, sir. One, help me understand when you talk about the PCR cycling. Can, can you explain? Amplification. One, you know, one, explain PCR for the committee so it's on video and any other members watching home. Can you explain PCR and what you meant by the cycling in the 28 versus the 35 or the 40? The PCR polymer chain assay. It is a, it's like the DNA testing. They want to find out who killed somebody, right? It's like a DNA test. It amplifies this biological material bigger and bigger and bigger so you can see it and go, oh, there it is. I get the picture now. I see what it is. Well, when you amplify but is that the test? Is that a test for COVID? Is that what you're talking about? The PCR swab up the okay, nose. Okay, so you test. swab up the nose. That's what you're calling PCR. That's correct. And then when you go to analyze that, 
that's where you the 28 versus the 40 is how much you magnify it is that it's just it's, please it's, clear that up sure it's um it's like a, a an overhead projector you blow things up okay okay you blow it up a little bit bigger a little bit bigger you blow it, they cycle it over and over and over so they expand it out so they can see what they have okay okay and before january 20th what explain the that the cdc had the cycling encouraged the cycling to be up to 40. the original inventor of the thing okay the, de the developers he come out in an interview before he passed before coming out before covid come out and he said Fauci is going to, and his people are going to exploit this. He said anything above 28 cycles is, is horrible. It, they're going to exploit it to their own. But, but help me understand what it means by what makes it horrible. Is it, is it telling, it, it, is it giving it, a false positive? That, that's what false, I'm trying to bring yes, this down sir. to lamest terms for everybody on the committee and people watching. False positive. Okay, so now before... Before January 20th, it's 40, 40 cycles, and it's, which it's totally giving distorts. more false positives. Even Fauci said that in July of 2020. He said anything above 35, Fauci okay. said this, anything above 35 is complete, bogus, false positive, worthless. And the CDC had to set at 40. So that being said at 40, let's say we're getting more false positives. What happens to the person with a false positive? If they got a false positive, are they going to the hospital? Well, it I'm depends just trying on their, to understand. It, sure. If, if a person is sick, okay, they go, I don't feel good like we've heard today. I don't feel good. I'm going to the doctor. Well, let's see what's going on with you. Well, early on, and I have some family members that are doctors. Early on, they would say, okay, you're COVID positive. And they go, well, I feel good. They said, well, you need to go to the hospital so they can evaluate you and watch you, monitor you, just in case you take a turn. Okay. So a lot of people initially went to the hospital to get monitored and et cetera, and they're hospitalized. And so what do they do when they go to the hospital? They put them in a bed. They shut the door, lock the door, essentially. They lay in the bed. The horse, it lays down, stays down. They get to where they do need oxygen. They do get to the point where they do develop hospital-acquired pneumonia, hospital-acquired, healthcare-acquired pneumonia, HCAP. And so, yeah, now you do have pneumonia after you've been there a week laying in a bed with the door shut, can't see your family, and eating yuck food. Duh, anybody get pneumonia. So you just develop, everybody's got bacteria. So that's how these people initially, a lot of them, in my opinion, would develop pneumonia. They're laying in a bed and they can't get out. But later on now, a lot of my doctor friends, uh, uh, they're, they're saying, go home. Go home on Mucinex, maybe a Z-Pack. Go home, and if you get bad, then come back in. But if they ask for hydrochloroquine or ivermectin, some doctors are starting to give it, even these that I'm speaking of. Okay, and then help me understand now, when you, we were talking about the decline in COVID patients, is that coinciding with when the cycling was dropping from 40 down to 28? Is that what you're, is that what you're telling the committee? When the cycling dropped from 40s down to 28, my sick patients were sick, except we worked with them a lot more. We were in there a lot more. We weren't scared to go in there and feed them. We weren't scared to go in there and get them up in the chair. We worked with them a lot more and they got out of there. But it's a, it's a fear thing. You know, people don't want to go in and die. They don't want to go in and take it home and kill their family members. So they really are backing off a lot. And then you add to it no bronchoscopies for these people. It's horrible. And you mentioned my, my second line of question is going to fall. You mentioned RSV. Um, my son had RSV when he was a, a baby. And we used to have to, my wife and I, even though he went to the hospital, we would give him breathing treatments. Can you explain some of the differences between RSV and a COVID patient, like a real COVID patient, a not, not a false positive? Just from, what, what, what would be the difference of those, of those two as far as the lungs would go? If, if they're swelled up, whatever it is, okay, whether it's RSV, flu A, anything, bacteria even, Everything that's on your lungs that's irritating your lungs, smoke inhalation from burning leaves, everything or everything will make your lungs be irritated. They're going to swell up. It's a natural body reaction. COVID patients that get this virus, it is an inflammatory response in your lungs. They swell up, and that swelling is a perfect breeding ground for bacteria. You need dark, you need warm, you need food, and you need water to grow bacteria. 
That extra swelling is the water. That's the breeding ground that RSV will be treated, yes, with breathing treatments, yes, with steroids, but they're going to get antibiotics because every doctor knows that's the perfect breeding ground for pneumonia to get started. So they nip it early. So when you come in for COVID, you get treated the same way. You get antibiotics, breathing treatments, and steroids. But the difference is with COVID patients, you get a locked door, you get an iPad maybe, and you don't get patients up in the chair as much. You're not giving them no real physical therapy in that, yes, therapy is a lot ordered, but they're just not working with All us. Right. Well, thank you for that. And the Senator for Burden has a question, but I appreciate it. Yes, sir. What position in the bed or uh, chair? You're saying you're not getting them up and moving, not getting any physical activity. <clears throat> what, what percentage in a 24-hour period are they on? Can you tell me whether they're prone? Uh, what degree are they, uh, I don't know the terms, uh, back to stomach? Uh, most people, when they lay in the bed, they lay flat on the back. Unless we as nursing, who are encouraged to go in there and turn them in position every two hours, a lot of time we'd schedule that one to turn in position in case that they had incontinent care. We'd go in to check them for that. And that's when we would turn them while after doing personal care. Um, now, in the units, they have beds that are on auto tilt. And they may go in there even less frequently. They typically manage those patients from the hallway, and the IV tubing goes across the floor, <coughs> sandwiched between the glass plates, across the room, and up into their bed. So they manage all the IV fluids out here and wear a simple flu mask and don't go in there. What prompted you to leave the hospital setting and go to the in-home uh, treatment the, setting? Uh, I left Anmed, which was my home base for 18 years, because I saw at least 14 on my unit COVID, not COVID, regular pulmonary telemetry nurses get COVID. They said, oh, I was positive, I was positive, I was positive. I had it. I took my 10 days at home. We did not retest our employees when they come back. They did their 10 days at home of quarantining after being COVID positive. They all come back and they said, I had the sniffles, I had a cough, I had an upper respiratory infection. So you left the hospital to end care for I try left to stay the hospital, safe, I left try to the get hospital, away from the virus? I left the hospital because I wasn't afraid of COVID no more. Oh, I wanted to go okay. travel nursing and make the big bucks. Had you ever? Okay. So quite a bit of uh, pay increase. I, I, yeah, 120 <coughs> bucks an hour what, compared uh, to 40. What's your introduction to the committee? Uh, how, did you, how were you made aware of this hearing today? Do you well, follow the work of the committee? Um, um, well, first, let me say, when I was on the floor at Anderson, I saw I'm looking so for real short answers because I'm okay. trying my chairman's patience. Uh, I'm just sorry. I, I left the hospital because I wasn't afraid of COVID no more. I saw so many people get over it, so I went COVID nursing. But... After COVID nursing, I realized that I cannot go back. I cannot go back. I saw too much and so much I disagree with. I just can't go back. How were you made aware of your oh, opportunity sorry, to sorry. testify today? I uh, was sitting on my couch and my wife said, you know, Delta's here. Delta's back. And Delta's, and I was like, they can't bring it back. They can't bring COVID back. They got the same PCR. They can't bring it back like it was in 2020. Not that big pandemic thing. This is... Somebody's monkeying with a PCR machine again. And I said, So there was a notice on this to, meeting about four yeah, or five I, days ago. How, I how, went what to, was your portal? My, my wife saw something on Facebook about a freedom rally at Prisma Hospital in Greenville. People wanting to not take the shot, be mandated to take the shot, nursing staff. And I said, Oh, I got to go stand out there with them. And just standing out there with them, even though I'm out of it, even though I'm done. I went out there and said, I got to stand and support these people. This is wrong, making people take a shot or lose your job, which makes you lose your house, et cetera. You can't nurse anymore. But you're insulated because you're retired. Yes. That's, so right. I'm not that noble. I'm not going to lose anything. So when I went Thank to you. that thing, I met a couple of people that said, please come to our next rally. And then they invited me to come here and begged me to come here. So that's how and why. I, I didn't plan on speaking out. I'm not a public speaker. I'm the bump on a log that never says anything, honestly. And I'm sorry to take up so much of your time. Appreciate well, we've, we've you. actually enjoyed hearing from the heart and just something that you've actually done. And I really appreciate you being here. And I got a lot of COVID nurses and friends that are saying the same thing, but they can't speak out because they still have a house payment. And they're really upset about this. Thank you. Thank you. Who's up? Who's up next? Who's up next, please? Uh, 